uh, possible. So I think leadership issues are, are important in this uh, in this conversation. So it's important that uh, we are able to foreground that uh, that uh, essentially is uh, um, is uh, is an aggregation, a constellation of the efforts, uh, chiefly led by the board, and of course uh, at an implementation execution level is uh, is um, is the officers. So on the plant condition, we made the point that the uh, the ramping up of uh, of plant maintenance very important, and that's why I made the point uh, earlier on that if you look at the period uh, December 2023 going into January of 2024, we took out 18% of the total generation capacity, about 19 9,000 megawatts at a go for plant maintenance, and we are beginning to see that these machines are coming back uh, um, into service. They are coming back on load and they are adding to the capacity on the grid and this is helping us to address, if you like, uh, the demand. And we are getting to situations more regularly where, uh, if you like, uh, supply um, is ahead of, uh, of demand, of course, during this period. And we'll see that more of these machines will come on stream as we go towards uh, the more winter period. So it's important that we, we are able to appreciate that. So, um, and we are doing that within, uh, within limits. So what I'm saying is that it's not reckless. So just uh, taking everything out for maintenance. There's a need for us to ensure that uh, um, we, we are able to, uh, to meet the demand to the degree that is uh, possible. If you are, you are you meant to initiate load shedding, it's not at the elevated levels of load shedding. We have seen it during the period of December. We've seen it as we transitioned into the year. We have seen it over the past uh, 11 or, or 12 days. So essentially, it's a testimony to, to those efforts. Again, uh, at ESCOM, they also established a, a war room to ensure that uh, you are able to have a focus, laser focus attention on how you are able to deal with uh, with plant maintenance. Accelerated uh, uh, soaring, uh, sourcing of uh, of spares and uh, ensuring that uh, we are able to establish uh, long-term uh, service contracts. Uh, so on areas that are problematic, uh, the Achilles heel, you are able to design contracts over a, a, an extended period and of course uh, performance space so that uh, what we are incentivizing is the megawatts on the grid and not incentivizing people coming to fix contractors, coming to fix machines that are failing. And that's the work that uh, thanks to the leadership of, uh, of the board and management uh, that we are where we are today. And then uh, to also address uh, the issues of um, inadequate capacity. So we, here we are accepting that um, ESCOM is not the silver bullet, if you like. So our problems with regards to load shedding will not be solved by ESCOM. You, ESCOM alone, it's a major player, at least in the short, the, the, the short term. But I think you need the additional generation capacity. And that's why um, and the, the need to expedite that engagement with the independent uh, power producers to the extent that the uh, ESCOM can make a contribution. We are able to get them on stream, on load as soon as possible. You know the reforms that have been introduced, truncating the period with regards to uh, the um, 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 uh, environmental impact assessment, the water use licenses I I shared with the general public, uh, the efforts that have been made to ensure that you truncate that uh, period and make it possible for the IPPs to be on stream as uh, as soon as uh, as power as uh, as po uh, possible, and then also the planned repowering of. Uh, uh, stations uh, that were shutting. So, I mean, you know that they, they delayed the decommissioning so that we continue to sweat these assets as we build the new generation capacity and also accepting that these machines are aging. At some point, they have to be retired. We have to commit to our nationally uh, determined contribution. So, we are not deviating from that. Just an appreciation that you are confronted with a crisis. It requires, uh, if you like, uh, extraordinary measures, including, amongst others, that delayed decommissioning and then as we build uh, additional uh, new generation capacity outside the coal fleet, then you can go elegantly into the retiring of, uh, of these units. And then the issues around the skills and expertise. So just an admission that uh, as a result of both the objectives and subjective challenges that we're confronting ESCOM, uh, there's been a hemorrhaging of skills. So it's important that we are able to uh, ensure that uh, we get the right people um, um, into the right position and thanks to, like I said, at the apex level, the board has made the appointment of uh, uh, the CEO and of course uh, also made the appointment of uh, the head of generation. Uh, that stabilization is important and the head of generation, uh, Mr. Numalo, also made the uh, 
um, appointments at the levels of uh, stations to ensure that we, we get the most experienced, uh, um, talented of, uh, of those uh, from within the ranks of ESCOM to be assigned these uh, responsibilities. They need to ramp up uh, training. That's the work that uh, Mr. Marogan is doing, uh, following on uh, what um, Caleb, uh, the estuary CEO, has been doing at ESCOM. Of course, the totality of management is important. And we also accepted that there's, there's a need from time to time to draw from uh, external experts, you know, that uh, uh, they say that the common platform where government engages with private sector on areas of um, a deficit in relation to expertise we are able to draw from the private sector. I think it's a symbiotic relationship. I think we're all standing to, to benefit out of that. And that's uh, part of the efforts that have been um, uh, introduced. Uh, and of course, uh, we introduce also ensuring that there has to be a culture of uh, accountability, consequence management. When people commit to certain targets, if those targets are not met, first you try to assist. And if you think that um, uh, really it's a lost cause, then you need to ensure that you introduce uh, consequence management. It's a managerial function, of course, not necessarily in my domain. But I'm just reflecting on the work that uh, ESCOM has done, has done uh, exceptionally well. And then there are issues of um, uh, fraud and, uh, and corruption. Uh, the fact that the uh, ESCOM has um, uh, introduced greater levels of, uh, of monitoring to ensure that uh, we undermine, if you like, uh, incidents of, uh, of fraud and, uh, and corruption to ensure that uh, it is sustained over, over a period of time. So it's important that there's a uh, greater levels of appreciation, that it's a constellation of these efforts that are helping us to get to, to where we are. And then there's issues around the procurement, the speed of procurement, agility of procurement uh, from the right uh, service providers. It must still remain transparent. It must still be competitive. Working with National Treasury, design a bespoke framework that makes it possible for ESCOM to ensure that they get to these spare parts as, as quickly as possible without undermining those principles of transparency um, and, and competitiveness. So uh, that relaxation does not amount uh, to discounting the importance of transparency um, and, and competitiveness. So we're found, we're finding that the bespoke uh, solution. And then the issues of funding. So outside the, the fiscal support, I think it's important that the, um, ESCOM was able to better manage, if you like, the deployment of uh, capital, uh, the deployment of uh, maintenance budget, so that they, um, we undermine leakage. Uh, and, and ESCOM has, uh, has made uh, available funds for outage and midlife uh, refurbishment. When I say midlife refurbishment, if you like uh, philosophy maintenance. These machines are designed um, to operate for X number of years. The expectation is that uh, half into the life of that uh, design, uh, design life, you do major outage. So that major, is, uh, it talks to the amount of work that has to be done, the period that uh, that machine is out on outage, and of course, by definition, also the amount of money that is uh, available. So there's, um, the management of that is important, so that as you take out the machines, the budget is available, the space are, are ready, so that uh, you don't uh, experience outage slips. When you commit that, I'll return this machine by this time, you indeed return the machine by that time, because there's been uh, proper planning, and funding is not, uh, is not an issue. The issues of... Um, environmental uh, uh, compliance, uh, what ESCOM has done engaging with the uh, Department of Fisheries, Forestry and Environment is to say that we think that uh, without undermining uh, the health uh, of uh, surrounding communities, without uh, necessarily coming out as uh, people who, who don't appreciate the impact of uh, uh, the emissions on, uh, on climate change, I think it's important that uh, we need to uh, account for those, but also have an appreciation that we need to continue to, um, if you like, uh, support the South African uh, economy. So we have uh, uh, proposed an emission reduction plan that is uh, achievable. That's not necessarily out of our bounds, but still remains uh, ambitious. Ambitious, I mean, ensuring that we are keeping to the commitment of a uh, reduction of uh, of, um, of, uh, of emissions so that uh, we don't um, impact uh, negatively, adversely, uh, the life of, um, of communities. And then on the coal, remember that one of the major issues that uh, had received public attention was around the quality of coal and, and all those uh, things that surrounded, uh, if you like, uh, the logistics arrangements with regards to coal. 
So what ESCOM has done is a, a better engagement, uh, if you like, uh, with the mines in relation to both the quality and the quantity of coal. Uh, so that uh, we are addressing the, the issues of the, the quality of coal and we ESCOM has made the point that it's got implications on the performance of these machines, their efficiency, their reliability. So it's important that that conversation has happened. That conversation continues to happen, it's sustained over a period of time. And they need to renegotiate uh, some of uh, the agreements and then greater investments in what we call cost plus uh, mines. So these are mines where um, um, uh, at the um, uh, adjacent to the power stations where the, the, the coal is conveyed via a conveyor belt. Uh, ESCOM has got an obligation in, re in relation to this kind of construct, construct capital to ensure that we continue to mine. One of the issues we had uh, experienced was uh, underinvestment in the cost plus mines, resulting in, uh, if you like, issues of uh, 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 coal quality, coal shortages. So working with the, the mines who are able to make these investments and ensure that we are able to address this, uh, this uh, situation. And then there are issues uh, in relation to uh, the new build defects. So you remember that um, one of the issues that had received uh, public attention was uh, the issues with regards to the new builds. When, when I say new builds, I'm talking of Kusile and Midupi, that there are inherent defects. Some of them have to do with, if you like, uh, with uh, the shenanigans if, um, surrounding procurement, their inability to monitor and, and observe uh, the quality of uh, the workmanship there, um, if you like, the originality of uh, some of uh, the components, and resulted in, in many failures as a result of that. So that's an area that has uh, received uh, attention, and ESCOM has a solution for that. And they uh, developed uh, and tested some of these solutions on MIDUP Unit 3, and the intention is that uh, you're using that template to roll it out to all other, other units so that uh, we are able to achieve the desired performance. So the point I'm making is that ESCOM didn't just lament the situation. So it's done everything possible to ensure that with the exceptional expertise that resides within ESCOM, we are able to find solutions, and those solutions are um, uh, beginning to bear fruit as, as we are seeing now. And then uh, on the issues of uh, Rotec uh, Industries, the fixing of the turbines, the, the center lines there, uh, greater levels of uh, oversight, additional expertise to ensure that we are able to address these challenges. Uh, Rotec, if you like, uh, is an engineering arm of ESCOM. So the point there is important, just an appreciation that the ESCOM had over a period of time built sufficient internal capacity um, from an engineering point of view, research point of view, innovation point of view. You find that with this new leadership led at the board level by Dr. Amteto and the, the team of men and women who constitute the board, the executive management team, we are retaining all of those uh, um, into force and you are beginning to see that uh, the constellation of these efforts uh, can only help to improve uh, the performance of, uh, of the grid. And then what are some of the successes so far as a result of these uh, interventions that I've uh, shared with you? Is that the National Treasury, like I said, they relaxed the, some of the requirements, so this results in the, the speed of procurement. Uh, so uh, we, we, we are reducing um, slowly this thing of outage slips, because outage slips is our inability to return the units at the time that you promise we'll return them, as a result of, amongst others, uh, if you like, the inordinate uh, process that uh, um, accompanies the procurement process. And I really want to uh, emph emphasize, because this point can be overemphasized, you are not undermining transparency, you are not undermining uh, competitiveness, it's just the speed with which you are able to uh, procure. The nimbility, so you must be nimble, you must be agile um, on your feet to ensure that you are able to address this situation, especially when you have units failing, you don't have time to plan. So it's important that uh, the shortest possible time is taken, of course, uh, with due regard to um, um, uh, professionalism, proper work, that these machines are retained. It's a function of uh, the procurement environment. So, so we have designed this procurement uh, to be bespoke, uh, to, to, to reflect the characteristic nature of ESCOM, and I'm sure that in other SOEs it will take a different <coughs> complexion. But here's just an appreciation that speed is, uh, is important. I've made the point on the allocation of uh, outage budgeting has improved. So when I say outage budgeting, so I'm talking about planned maintenance. We know that we are going to, 
ESCOM knows is going to take this unit out in the next three months, make sure that the spares are available. For you to ensure that the spares are available, appreciating that there's long lead time. Some of these spares are not uh, bought off the shelves. That's the nature of the units that you are dealing with. So money must be available. So money can come later. You take out the machines and you are waiting for money. Money must be available. Procure uh, long lead items. They should be available. By the time you take out the, the units, you know that the resources are there. The human resources, the components are there. You have dealt with the capital requirements to get the components in the workshop. Then let's get the machine fixed and we're able to, to return it on time. I did make the point that uh, we have succeeded in uh, engaging productively with external stakeholders. They are part of this conversation. They are contributing to the resolution of this uh, problem. And uh, the, the priority uh, power stations there are receiving uh, attention. We have made the point, Duva, Kendall, Kusile now is, gra is graduating out of uh, priority power stations. Because thanks to the work that has been done by um, a team of diligent men and women, a professional patriotic committed to the resolution of this problem. So Kusile will not flag as uh, one of those, uh, of those uh, power stations as a result of this work that we've been doing. Of course, uh, uh, Tutuka still remains a challenge, uh, working with uh, the station manager there, someone that has been appointed exceptional skills, uh, Mr. Bruce Moyo, and his team, we show that we are going to take it out of this uh, situation. So we want to graduate the priority power stations because we appreciate that once we get these ones right, then uh, we, are, we are sailing. Uh, I think uh, we, 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 we would have gone through, sailed through the headwinds, and uh, we, we will be uh, in the open and are able to ensure that uh, on a very sustained basis you don't have load shedding, and then we work on securing a energy sovereignty for, for the country going into, into the future. So I think it's important that uh, there's that appreciation of, uh, of what has been happening. Just a juxtaposition of uh, what is this kind of improvement in numbers terms from a low shading point of view. So if you are to take uh, the, the first to the 31 of, uh, of March uh, 2023, you will see that they will only have the, about two uh, um, uh, uh, periods of stage one load shading. And now, now we, in this similar period, this uh, financial year, um, or this year, or the calendar year, we only have one, one, uh, one stage of load shading. When it comes to stage two, uh, the previous uh, 23 were sitting at 3, and uh, this year it was higher at, uh, at, uh, at 12, and I'll come back to that. Uh, at stage, uh, stage 3, we had uh, seven, um, um, if you like, uh, uh, stages of uh, stage 3. Um, in this uh, period, the 1st to the 31st of March 2023, in 2024, we had 9, again higher than what we had experienced. But I think if you look at the higher stages, stage four, last year, March, this period, the, the month of March was 12, this year it's four. Uh, stage five, uh, last year, uh, in March, it was six, we didn't have this year. Stage six, uh, of course, we didn't have for both years. And if you put them together uh, for the month of March, a uh, uh, number of days of uh, load shedding, it was uh, um, uh, 30, 30, 30 occasions where we had uh, these uh, various stages of load shedding compared to 26. But what is the important conversation there? Is that you can see that uh, uh, stage one to stage two accounted for half of uh, what we experienced this year. As compared to stage, uh, stage four and stage uh, um, uh, five of last year, last year accounted to half of what was experienced last year. So what is the message you are conveying here? Is that the intensity of load sharing is coming down. And that's the point I make all the time. It's just a general appreciation on the trend line so that uh, there's that uh, appreciation. Now, oh, okay, that's the, the trend line that uh, we, we are experiencing. Of course, uh, with regards to the EAF uh, at the uh, year end, um, I think the preliminary indication is that we'll be at the uh, 54.6 away from that target of uh, 60, 60%, 6%, uh, 5.4 percentage points out. But we can see that uh, going into the future, we are confident about this ability. And of course, what is important there is just an appreciation that uh, we had aggressive plan maintenance, the point I made all the time. 
So if we had uh, relaxed that plan maintenance, I had made the point uh, previously, you will see that will be much closer to that target that ESCOM has set itself for, for, the, for the financial year, much closer to 60% of EAF, but went very aggressive on the plan maintenance, of course, within acceptable limits, and then we're beginning to, uh, to see the results of that now um, as we move into the future. And then going into the future, what is it that uh, we should expect, uh, at least in the immediate future, um, before the end of uh, this, uh, this uh, calendar year? So essentially I'm talking in the next five months, what is the, the message you are conveying to the country? I'm happy to say that uh, uh, thanks to uh, the ingenuity of the leadership of ESCOM, we are able to bring Middle before much earlier than anticipated. Remember that this is a unit that had gone out, I think, as a result of fire. And if you look at the lead time that were uh, required for us to get the, a, a brand new generator, I think the expectation was that we're going to return Midupi unit number five by 2025. The uh, management of ESCOM looked across the world, find a, a generator of a similar specification. Uh, it's a second-hand generator. Appreciate that these generators are designed uh, to have a life of up to 50 years, and this one still had about 15 years uh, of life. We were able to procure that generator, and that generator now has been delivered uh, to uh, the power station made will be on the on the five the fifth of uh, March. Uh, and of course, it was then unloaded. You can imagine the size of that generator on the 11th of March, and then we are confident that it will be commissioned by August of uh, 2024. So essentially, we have uh, truncated, reduced that by approximately a year. We are able to bring it early, and as uh, if you like the innovation ingenuity that is brought about by an exceptionally competent board and having appointed the most uh, competent. Uh, uh, if you like, management team, that uh, beyond the norm, what is common, what are the other solutions that are available? And just an appreciation that you can get this generator secondhand, of course, with the necessary um, assurances guaranteed from the original equipment manufacturer that it still has life. We can extract life out of that, and then we're able to relieve uh, the grid. We're able to uh, bring that 800 megawatt. That is in August of, uh, of 2024. Quebec Unit 2, you know that it has gone out, extension of license. Of course, we'll make our submissions uh, to NERSA. They, they'll make the determination whether the extension is, is uh, granted or not. But from where we are doing our best, and we are confident that uh, we are on track to return this by September of 2024, that's another 932 megawatts. And again, Kusile, as you know, that is still a construction site. There's one unit that uh, still is yet to be uh, commissioned and, and synchronized. So we are com confident that uh, uh, by uh, September uh, we'll be able to get that 800 megawatts. So essentially, if you come to think of it, in the next uh, uh, five months, we should be able to, to get, uh, um, uh, if you like, uh, 2,583 or so megawatts of new generation capacity. Uh, so that's the message that we are conveying. So it's just the, the prospects in the immediate future. And that the immediate future is in the next five months. And this is the work that the team is, has been doing. And of course, uh, the issues of the permanent stake uh, project remains uh, on course uh, uh, with the units being uh, uh, synchronized between November of 2024 and uh, 2025. I'm talking about unit uh, one to three. Remember that we have a temporary solution, uh, so it's important that we restore the original conditions because we have made a commitment to the Minister of Environmental uh, Fisheries and Forestry that it's an interim solution. We do appreciate the downside from the health implication, the environmental implication. We need this window. We'll do everything possible to ensure that uh, uh, we are able to address the environmental and health adverse impact. We presented a plan. On the strength of that plan, we're granted this uh, 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 temporary solution. So it's important that uh, there's that uh, appreciation. I was reading somewhere that we're going to lose 2,400 uh, megawatts. Uh, of course, I mean, these things are done in stages. So at any given point, when you connect the uh, one unit into the permanent stack, it's just 800 megawatts. I think it's important that uh, the context uh, is, uh, is appreciated. And then on the coal stockpiles, I'm happy to say that uh, the levels of uh, the, all the stockpiles are, are healthy. Uh, so, and then 
uh, also accounted for wet conditions. So you'll find that the issue of uh, wet coal and the like should be something of the past. ESCOM's leadership management uh, is transfixed on the resolution of uh, this problem, including all um, individual components of the value chain. So on the coal side, the point I'm making is that these are things that have uh, received uh, additional attention. So those are some of the highlights. I'm making this point so that the country must have a, an appreciation that the kind of improvement you are seeing is not an accident. Uh, so essentially, it's, a, it's an investment made by men and women, competent, uh, primarily at the uh, ESCOM. The leadership, uh, of course, uh, at an executive uh, uh, level, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the political leadership, the leadership uh, uh, principally at the board level, but most importantly, the CEO and his executive management team are able to deliver the kind of results that we are seeing. I have to emphasize that there will be setbacks. So it's the nature of this. So if tomorrow there's some low chain, it doesn't mean that the, uh, the trend line is uh, dissipated. So it's important that there's an appreciation of this trend line. We are trying to undermine opportunities for these units to fail. Because as they fail, then the system operator must initiate load sharing. So I'm making the point is the trend line. You can see the, 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 uh, the kind of benefits we are seeing. There will be setbacks. Those setbacks are given. So when you encounter a setback, and by setback I mean when there's load sharing, don't think, oh, we're, 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 we're diverting from that trend line. We remain on course in relation to that trend line. And like I said, this uh, additional generation capacity of these three units, I have not yet accounted from new generation that is coming from the private sector. We will share that with you in due course. So that there's an overall appreciation that we are addressing the totality of this, uh, this intervention. So there's no decoupling. There's nothing called that uh, um, the kind of uh, improvement we are seeing is as a result just of the improvement of the EAF outside what the, uh, the renewables are giving us, or alternative is as a result of the renewables outside the EAF. No, that's a myth. It's a misnomer. It's all of these things put together. So there shouldn't be a binary conversation. It's a misleading conversation. It's about pulling all of these things together. And that's why the Energy Action Plan says fix ESCOM. I've shared with you in detail the work that is being done by ESCOM. New generation capacity, renewables, private sector investment, the issues of the reforms. When you pull all of that together, then it results in the kind of, uh, um, in the long term, energy sovereignty. In the short term, ESCOM has got a disproportionate amount of responsibility to help us to resolve this. But it's the totality of these interventions that are going to help us to, to resolve the challenge uh, going into the future. I'm happy to say the following, of course, ESCOM did uh, release, a, a, if you like, a, a media statement in this regard. The issues around undermining vertical integration. I spoke uh, at nauseam in the last uh, update, uh, ensuring that there's competitiveness, there's multi multiple players on the generation side, multiple buyers, create a platform that uh, ensuring that you procure on a non-discriminatory basis, you are democratizing uh, the, the platform. We think that the aggregate, the net result amongst others, is uh, electricity that uh, is relatively affordable, uh, greater adoption of uh, technology and innovation, increasing levels of uh, efficiencies will result in greater levels of uh, investment because you have opened up, but you have not privatized. ESCOM continues to be a major player on the generation side. We'll come back on the ESCOM um, project on the generation side, but we accept that you have to open up for private sector so that you are able to allow for this uh, competitiveness and the net gain to two, two of them that they're uh, worth mentioning. The first one is that uh, there's, uh, the grid is becoming more and more stable because we've got uh, uh, more players on the generation side. The second one is that the uh, energy, electricity doesn't see uh, exponential increases, that it becomes unaffordable, resulting in energy hunger. Essentially by that I mean the electricity is available, but the people can afford it. That's energy hunger. You don't want to get to that uh, situation. It must remain uh, uh, affordable. Uh, and that's why it's important that this competitiveness is introduced. So the National Transmission Company of South Africa has uh, received consent from the relevant lenders and creditors. I did say now all of them. Uh, the passing of resolutions by government uh, and boards of uh, NTCA and, and ESCOM, um, as well as the approval for electricity license and other regulatory requirements by NERSA. So these are 
the substantive suspensive conditions so these are condition conditional to the proper functioning full functioning of uh, ntsa all of those things have been met and then the next steps really is that the fulfillment of the companies act uh, requirements and also once all asset systems and employees have been transferred to the national transmission company of south africa and trading and trade commences the ntcsa will be wholly owned escom um, a subsidiary. So this is an important part uh, because I think in other domains they talk about privatization. Underlying, it's wholly owned ESCOM, uh, ESCOM um, uh, holding subsidiary. ESCOM is an asset of the state. Uh, so the South African citizen is a shareholder in ESCOM. So there is no relinquishing of that ownership. NTCSA remains in that stable. It's part of uh, the ESCOM stable wholly owned by ESCOM Holdings. So the South African public is a shareholder in NTCSA. So it's not a precursor to privatization. I think it's important that they, there has to be that they appreciation. As I conclude, just to indicate that um, you can see that the, the weekly averages have been going up. Uh, uh, I think the, the, past, uh, the past week, uh, we, we are now at uh, 28,000 28, uh, uh, megawatts compared to the 27,000 megawatts. An area that uh, should receive attention and is receiving attention from ESCOM side is to bring down the unplanned capacity loss, loss factor and the partial load losses. Uh, because that speaks to the megawatts that are outside, that are not uh, generating, that are not on load. Uh, of course, the average uh, for, for the week 25 to 29th of March was uh, 14,000, and then the past week was uh, 15,000. Our target, the target internally is that just be at 14,000 um, as a minimum. Uh, you know that in terms of their uh, summer outlook, they put it at 14,500. So it's important that uh, we keep to that message, and in fact, we improve it. And that's an area that uh, um, a blemish, and I want to say to the country that it's something that is uh, receiving attention. So that as we move into the colder period, as uh, uh, demand is going to be ramped up, uh, once we were at sub-14,000, we are confident about our ability to ensure that the sustained period of uh, lower stages of load shedding, even no load shedding on some days. So it's important that there's that general appreciation. Having said all of the above, I do admit that uh, there are areas where we need improvement, as is in the nature of any organization, continuous search for improvement, even at the ESCOM point, um, uh, 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 point of view, I think the unplanned capacity loss factor and the partial load losses are areas that uh, require the attention. Just as I conclude, I think it's important that uh, we also just a brief reflection on the renewables. And that's a point I made. I think what, one of the things that uh, I think was, has been a major shortcoming of uh, uh, the briefing I gave was just the focus on ESCOM and not just sharing with you what, what, what is the performance on the renewable side. And that gives uh, life to this conversation of a, a binary uh, discussion. Is the EAF, this is, uh, uh, if you like, uh, renewables. No, we must do both. So just to give you an indication, the total renewables uh, is about 6,430 megawatts, made up of concentrated solar power, the wind, PV, and also hybrid. Uh, so when you pull all of those together, it's 6,430 megawatts. And then we did make the point, uh, take account of uh, rooftop uh, installations, about uh, 5,440. So what, what, have we, what have we experienced? So this is a point to be made, is that during the summer months, the wind generation aligns almost perfectly to the high uh, evening peak demand and the low night uh, minimum demand. So there's a correlation between uh, uh, what we are generating from wind and the peak demand. So it's really performing uh, its intended function, that it must contribute to the fleet of ESCOM so that we are able to meet the uh, peak demand. However, um, in winter, when the cold front uh, passes through the Western and Eastern Cape, the wind generation increases significantly. So you are going to see, if you like, a greater contribution. In a Houting area, the cold weather drives uh, demand for electricity. 
and we know that the, the concentration of load in in, in Gauteng, you, you also know that the most number of households again uh, uh, in Gauteng, and, and of course, uh, if it gets cold, it's going to drive uh, uh, that demand. And that's why I'm saying we must ready ourselves from the from the for, for the winter condition. And at the same time, the wind generation reduces significantly due to the low trough uh, behind the uh, uh, the front. And this is a double whammy. What is the double whammy? Is that the um, that the reliance on wind is coming down? Huh? Uh, when we go into into this winter period, it's coming down. So the peak is going is going up uh, during that uh, winter, uh, but uh, the contribution of wind is coming down for those uh, factors. Um, and then uh, you are losing on additional generation demand, and then there's a ramp up in the demand, and you can see the the gap between generation and demand goes up, and that's what is uh, undermining, if you like, that equilibrium, the perfect equilibrium that makes it possible for us not to have uh, load shedding. So it's important that there's that general appreciation, and of course, uh, doing everything possible to undermine those gaps. But the uh, new generation capacity from the multiplicity of sources is going to help us to address this uh, this situation on the rooftop solar solution so we have broken it down so you can see that the uh, housing accounts for about 1500 of that 5400 or so of uh, the mega of the megawatt so essentially you are sitting at about 30 percent of installed roof capacity is in housing and it's on account of two things really is the most populous and therefore most number of uh, uh, households and of course there's a concentration of industry and of course we do have uh, some of the most affluent suburbs here and that's why you see that the rollout of rooftop, uh, rooftop solar solutions so it's important that uh, there's that uh, appreciation so if you have um, if you like a cloudy day like today inclement weather and this is across the country we are likely not to benefit from this uh, this uh, this assets and that's why I'm saying that uh, it's a misnomer to talk of uh, renewables saving us from load shedding. It's a combination of that. Everyone now draws from the grid. Even those who want to recharge uh, their batteries, they are going to draw from the grid. So it's important that it's a holistic conversation. It's just a general appreciation of where we are. So we'll continue to do this reflection, just an appreciation of, uh, of where we are. And you can see that the, the February month, the January month, we had seen a, a, a significant am amount of uh, that uh, generation capacity. And the rest is almost uh, evenly dispersed uh, across uh, the country. And as expected, the Northern Cape, the least amount of, uh, of households and industry, uh, we can expect that the rooftop solar solutions will be low, lower because uh, the amount of rooftop space, the total rooftop space is significantly lower as a result of uh, um, the, being the least uh, populated of, uh, of, of, the, of the provinces in the country. So we thought that it's important that there's that general appreciation of where we are. We continue to do the work, uh, not complacent, very, very far from where we, 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 we want to be, because where we want to be is about the elimination of load shedding. Uh, we don't celebrate the a extended period of no load shedding. We want to stand before the country and say we have eliminated load shedding. But there's an admission that for us to get there, it's a stepwise approach. First, reduce the intensity and frequency of load shedding. I've sh given you snippets of, um, of uh, um, facts that they confirm that we're going in that general direction. Like I always say, you don't have to believe me. Just uh, count the number of days your lights are, hours your lights are on or off in a day compared to the same period in the previous year. You will see that there's an improvement. But they uh, will do that uh, reduction slowly of the intensity and frequency of load shedding and will get to a point where we'll be able to declare to the country that we now have um, sufficient generation capacity with uh, enough buffer to account and accommodate any unexpected surge in, uh, um, if you like, um, uh, units uh, failing, a uh, cluster of units failing. Uh, still have the enough capacity to meet demand. Once we get to that stage, I'll be the first one to say to the country that we are over the line. We are now working on uh, energy sovereignty, energy security. But where we are, it's important, a uh, general appreciation that we are still fighting to improve that trend line to address the in both the intensity and frequency until we get to a point where load shedding is something that is behind us. So thank you very much, uh, Thagan.
Thank you very much, uh, Minister. Um, colleagues, we will now open the floor to questions uh, from members of the media. Do we have questions in the room? By a show of hands, do we have questions in the room? Uh, there's Katla Hotet. Do we have a roving mic? Uh, so, Katla, you'll use the table microphone and then um, we'll take her as well and we'll uh, stick to our established protocol where you uh, introduce yourself and the media house that you are representing. All right, uh, good morning, Minister. My name is Katla Hotel, working from the SABC. We just wanted to find out uh, your understanding of uh, where uh, you know, we find ourselves in terms of NASA passing uh, through those protocols to stage 16. Uh, we saw a lot of uh, people from the public reaching out to the media uh, just with an understanding of what do those you know, protocols mean, uh, what does uh, a ramp up uh, those uh, you know, protocols to stage 16 mean for consumers. It's just an indication uh, that maybe in the near future uh, we'll see ESCOM ramping up uh, you know, those shedding beyond stage 6. Uh, to maybe stage 16. Can I get a response from that? And maybe just give us a sense, Minister, uh, and you've been in the office for of over a year now, maybe give us a sense of uh, basically, uh, are we reaching an end? When can we expect those shedding to end? Because ultimately people, you know, coming through to view this briefing, be it in, be it out, uh, they would like to know as to when can we expect those shedding uh, to end? So when can we really expect those shedding then to end in this particular regard? And I'm able to also and then lastly, the third one on my end, give us a winter outlook. We see outside uh, that it's really bad. Uh, so are we going to see extraordinary measures applied by ESCOM here uh, going into the winter season to try by all means to cushion consumers, as we know very well, that around this time, uh, that's when the grid uh, becomes a little bit strained. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Katlawa. Thank you, Ashoni. Uh, Itumeleng, do we have questions online? Yes, we do have questions online. The first question is from Helmo Bruce from Independent Media. Why is ESCOM demand forecast for this year? What is the NASA approved budget for OCGT results? How has the recent bad weather impacted non ESCOM generation? Uh, what plans have an ESA above 80%? How is the sewage inch level at plants being addressed? And then the second second question is from Angelo Copula from TGTN. Minister, why not directly in your portfolio? What is your position in social getting a free pass on ignition levels? It appears to the laymen as if they are getting special treatment. Will this approach be adopted with non compliant power stations under your jurisdiction? And the third question is from Lamis or Magic from Miss 24. Does ESCOM or the minister have any response to a study by the Center for Research on Energy and Clean Air, which project there will be at least 30,000 deaths linked to delays? Uh, the second question is once in this unit 5 frequency phases, will the power station be operating at full capacity? Uh, thank you. Um, we'll now take responses. We'll start with uh, Mr. Shun Magam. He'll be followed by the minister. Thanks. It's on, right? 
Uh, thank you. I'll, I'll take the questions uh, linked to the uh, generation performance. Um, I think let's start off with uh, Katlejo. Uh, I think just in terms of the winter outlook, we're still going through a process of approval, but uh, the general sentiment uh, in terms of the plan for the outlook is to have our plan maintenance hovering around 3,000 and then to get the breakdowns um, to below 14,000, okay? And we believe with that scenario, um, we should be in a, in a good position in terms of uh, load shedding. There would be days, but uh, I think um, as you've seen previous uh, outlook plans, we plan on three scenarios. And the aspiration for the generation uh, team is to actually perform below the 14,000. So um, I think that will give us enough leeway in terms of uh, this coming winter, especially with a higher demand. Um, then in terms of the OCGTs, I think uh, in terms of the budget, um, this year once again as a trade-off uh, against load shedding, uh, slightly over the budget. However, when one looks at ESCOM's bottom line, uh, some of the IPP budget and some of the other um, expenses were under. So, so in terms of the bottom line, that's been the trade-off. Um, with regards to um, Medu P5, I think once Medu P5 comes online, um, that'll be commissioned. We still will have Medu P6. I'm sorry, uh, uh, you talked about Medu P5. I, I, I'm assuming it's Medu P4. Yeah. So I think it's Medu P4. Uh, once again, uh, the intent is for it to come back on its generating capacity of 800 megawatts. Um, I'm just thinking in terms of other questions that I've picked up. Um, Minister, I'm not sure if you want to take the rest. Eh? Okay. Okay, no, thank you very much uh, for those questions. I think the, the body that does uh, that planning for the various stages, I think that, that it's an independent uh, body that uh, really helps to ensure that uh, uh, from the systems operator point of view, there's a degree of uh, predictability if you had to get, go to those uh, levels of, uh, of, uh, of load shedding. Uh, so it doesn't suggest that uh, you are going to go to stage six load shedding. And the point I always make is that uh, we must allow each and everyone to make a contribution uh, from their own area of, uh, of competency, their area of mandate. They must execute their responsibility. So essentially now you know that uh, uh, even in the ultimate worst case scenario, uh, that the system operator has got the uh, ability to ensure that you protect the grid in a manner that all the players and the stakeholders understand. So that's the exercise that they, they've, been, they've been doing. I make the point that uh, everyone that can afford has uh, taken medical aid. Uh, so it doesn't uh, follow that uh, you are expecting that tomorrow you'll be hospitalized. So essentially it's an insurance measure. And that's what this uh, exercise has been doing. So it's got no correlation with uh, where we are at, uh, but simply to say that uh, going into the future, if you are to have this scenario, this is how the system operator must uh, manage the grid. So we welcome that. Uh, and I was saying that uh, uh, to colleagues, we must welcome that because there must be uh, proper planning, even for the worst case scenario. Huh? I always make the point that uh, it's important that uh, even when you go through a green patch, uh, um, uh, you are meeting all of your results. Every time you, you have to know that uh, if there's a doomsday scenario, uh, this is how we are going to manage that uh, that situation, and that's what the exercise is doing. So we we welcome it uh, as a, as part of a, if you if you like a broad articulation on how we, we are addressing the issues rather of uh, energy security in the in the country. Now that question I know every time it comes, it will, I will not stand here and mislead the country and say by this date is going to end. I'm simply sharing with you the efforts that we are making is giving us this trend line. I'm sharing with you what will come on stream new generation capacity in the next uh, uh, five, uh, five months or so. We'll come back and share with you what's coming on stream from the private sector. And I'll say that if all of these promises materialize, then it means by this period we should have uh, achieved uh, 
if you like, some degree of energy security with the fair and net load shedding. I'm noting that uh, at that point. Uh, so I, the last thing I want I will do is to mislead the country. We are not there. When we are there, I'll tell you that this is the date. Give give us an opportunity to address this. We understand the impatience, uh, uh, the grievance, uh, the anger that it has taken long. And I'm going to be brutally honest. That has been the nature of my engagement with the South African public uh, uh, household, uh, all the stakeholders' business. It's just the candid nature of the conversation. I think it's important. So I'm not in that uh, position to say by this date. I'll share with you the trend line. Once we have confirmed that new generation capacity, when is it coming on stream? Not just ESCOM, but uh, uh, if you like new generation, then we'll be in a position to say by this date, uh, we are confident that a generation will far exceed the demand with the necessary buffer to account for any unpredictability uh, without uh, requiring us to uh, initiate any stages of, uh, of load shedding. And then with regards to the issues uh, around uh, um, the Sasol emissions, I mean that uh, everyone makes a, an application to the minister of DFFE and the minister applies their minds and arrives at a determination. In the same manner, ESCOM has made uh, an application uh, to say that these are uh, em emissions that we think are achievable without necessarily undermining our ability to continue to generate electricity without uh, putting uh, uh, lives uh, at, uh, at great risk. We submit that to DFFE. The minister will make a determination. So I'm, I'm not about to encroach in that space. Really, that's not our space. We have done everything possible to satisfy what the requirements are. I have not uh, encountered that study. Of course, I'll go through it, what uh, people suggest uh, on what uh, uh, the implications of uh, an extended life of this uh, coal-fired power station. I guess that's the domain, if you like, uh, of the minister of DFF. He will make the submissions. She'll look at uh, all sorts of studies. Um, and, of course, their own internal study, the veracity of those studies, arrives at a determination. On the basis of that determination, then she'll be able to communicate to us. So it's, a, it's, a, it's something that we will leave to, to, the, to the minister of DFFE. And I did say that from a skills point of view, of course, uh, 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 ESCOM uh, gone back to, if you like, bolstering, bolstering uh, those uh, skills, uh, uh, the issues around uh, training, uh, the training center now is a hive of uh, activity. Uh, there's uh, uh, an appreciation of what is new generation that is likely going to come on stream. Of course, the issues of nuclear, you need to build that uh, pipeline amongst others. So ESCOM is looking at uh, all of that, and I'm sure that uh, at the right time they, will, they can share with you what are those details because that's in the management domain. The, the, the only reason why I was surfacing that is just to give the country a general appreciation that ESCOM is aware of uh, areas of weaknesses and those are, are attended to, including the bolstering of the skills, uh, ensuring we show up the skills because there's been some degree of hemorrhaging of skills over a period of time, restore ESCOM to its former glory. That's what Dr. Mteto is doing at the board level. Um, and and, and uh, Mr. Marokan and his executive management team, of course, supported by the executive authority, are confident about the future of ESCOM and its uh, role on the generation side together with new players in that space. It will become more competitive, like I said, and hopefully the, the net gain will be to the, to the grid itself, but also to the end, uh, end consumer. Okay, thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Minister and Mr. Shumagam for the clarity and the responses. We will now take um, our last round of questions. We will start in the room as we did um, initially. Um, I see Thoni's hand is up. Are there any other hands in the room? So we'll take Thoni and then we'll go to Gatleho and then to Itumeleng for the questions that have been shared virtually. Um, financial year. And then, um, for the minister also, I mean, you 
section that talks about the census and see and now you take care of our history and see it's like built in into that you can't say a specific date to when they put in the end. How long do you expect this period of sunshine I guess to, to end when you talk about those setbacks? And then um, maybe lastly related to that, um, how much does demand play in terms of what we're seeing at the moment? Because obviously in a period where it's become colder the past few days, but we still don't have late dinner. Um, yeah, how much does the demand play a role in that? Uh, thanks, Tony. Uh, mine is on the uh, solar PVs as well. Do we still see a government working to incentivize those that would need, especially businesses that would need to, you know, more or less uh, install solar PVs? Are we encouraging them to uh, go into that space as well in terms of helping ESCOM here? Because we've seen the minister give us an update on the intervention around that space. And also, um, as you mentioned, Minister, the issue of corruption that at, at ESCOM we're dealing with issues of corruption and making sure that we support uh, the new executive there, uh, Mr. Marokani, and uh, maybe give us a sense as well as to the, um, the SANDF members. Are they still there on the ground? Do we see some of these issues, some of these developments, um, and the security at some of these power stations like Mizuki being attributed to the fact that you still have a tight security in case something happens there, uh, looking at uh, the past whereby some of these uh, stations were uh, targeted. And also on the issue of coal, are we expected to uh, see a wide-scale investigation from your end as the department? Because you've mentioned here uh, that you know, you're working with mines to work around issues of coal and more or less clear uh, that particular issue. Are we more or less expecting a concerted effort towards an investigation as to what has happened in the past and why then uh, we find ourselves with this somewhat of, of a coal syndicate that will be operating in some parts of these mines, especially in the Malanga province. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Katla. We'll um, take questions that have been shared virtually. Do my length, please take us through. Uh, okay. Uh, Clarence Kuma from Engineering News. Given that Cabinet has its final meeting ahead of the 29th May poll, does that mean that the plan to facilitate private sector's uh, participation in the development of the grid has not been considered by the executive and cannot move ahead to implementation? The second question is, when will ESCOM present its winter plan? And the third question is, will ESCOM uh, continue to set EAS target as part of the recovery plan? And the last question from Terence is, when will the NTCSA be fully operational? And the second question is from Dine Erasmus from Business Day. Given that ESCOM missed its EA, EA, EAS target for 2023-2024, does the EAS target that was set for 2024-2025 yet still stand, or will this target be amended? And the last question is from Chris Leland from the EE business intelligence. Does the minister expects, expect the electricity regulation amendment bill will be enacted by the end of um, 2024? Thank you. Uh, so if you don't miss this, then it's just my previous question in the first round was an answer about the use of the OTCPs um, in the fifth, like this month or this period. So Mr. Sophie, can you have your name and your phone and then just call in? Yeah. Oh, okay. We'll text you the name and the uh, surname, the spelling. It's Mr. Eric Shunmakam from ESCOM's uh, Generation Division. And then we noted um, the question on the OCGT, the specific numbers. So we'll take uh, responses, uh, starting with uh, Mr. Shunmakam, followed by the minister. Thank you. So, so I think what's important is the message from the minister, right? is that you have the renewables complementing the base load. So if you really look at what's happened in terms of the diesel usage, okay, if the fleet performs well, and if you've got sunny days and the wind blows, you've got good support coming from the renewables, and, uh, and ultimately the usage on diesel is less, right? The other compensating factor is we also have pump storage to actually use that because during the day okay 
it's it's free electricity so ultimately we use that pump storage to also help in terms of the demand um, then you take a day like today when it's overcast right so even if you're, you're we, we've seen the performance is we've seen a slight uh, uh, decrease in, in in increase in UCLF which means the performance degraded a bit you also then have your uh, renewable resources not coming through and all that means is you're going to have to use diesel to actually uh, support the system. Hence, you'll see that variability. So in an ideal world, uh, we cater for this diesel to actually help during our morning peaks and evening peaks. Okay? Um, if we have sufficient reserves, then, then generally we will not use these diesel reserves because it's an expensive resource. And then once again, when you compare using this diesel resource to load shedding, it's, it's a much cheaper resource compared to load chain in the country. So I, I trust in terms of the issue around the, uh, the figures that you've been measuring over the last day or the last week that gives context. In terms of the budget, uh, in, uh, I know we are over. We are busy just wrapping up because it's year end with the figures. I think I'm happy to report in the, in the, in the coming uh, media briefs just to give you that feedback. Um, with regards to what's planned again for the coming year, I can confirm it's substantially lesser than what we planned for last year. Last year, I think, was a conscious effort that we, uh, through our shareholder, through National Treasury, because of what the projection was going to be in terms of load shedding, we actually uh, catered for that, and, and we know the budget was around 30 billion rand. And going into this coming year, once again, I think in the next briefing we can confirm the figures, but I know it's substantially lower. Um, then moving on to some of the other questions, uh, with regards to the winter plan, um, the winter outlook, the intent is to give feedback towards the end of April. We are just now following governance process, going through the various uh, approval process, and I think one that's done through uh, ESCOM's uh, communication, stakeholder uh, communication department, we will schedule that uh, that session and, and, and communicate. But uh, in keeping with uh, the tradition on winter, we will definitely do lesser planned maintenance. Um, and, and in terms of the plan for unplanned, the recovery plan will continue uh, to ensure that the unplanned maintenance is kept below the 14,000. However, you know, based on the reliability and explained by the minister, we do cater for, for two other scenarios. In terms of the EAF target, uh, and that's a non-negotiable. I think in keeping with our commitments with our shareholder and with the uh, NECOM, uh, the target uh, will continue. It's set at 65% at, uh, uh, EAF, uh, and then we will aspire towards moving towards 70%. So as much as we didn't achieve the target uh, for the last year, uh, I think there's, there's uh, non-negotiable from the, from the shareholder side. I think even pushing from the board, um, board wants to see us actually achieve the, the generation recovery plan. Uh, I think that's pretty much what I covered, uh, Minister. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Eric. Just to make the point, Loni, I, 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 I say that what we are tracking is a trend line. So a longitudinal study over a prolonged period, we use May of uh, 2023 as a baseline and see how we're doing relative to that. And I make the point that uh, given the nature of these uh, engineering units, it's almost a given that they are going to have setbacks. And by that, by setbacks, although we can see uh, the, the, the degree to which uh, some of these machines, when they come back, they are becoming more and more reliable, the efficiency levels are higher, uh, you find that there will still be those units that fail. So when those units fail, as Eric was saying, that uh, you, you, you see that uh, uh, one given day is uh, worse than the other, uh, you, you are going to experience that setback. The instrument you have is load shedding. What we are measuring is a trend line over that period. So even if it means that uh, tomorrow or sometime in the future, sometime this week, uh, there's load shedding uh, whatever the stage is, what we are looking at is a trend line. I think that's a, that's the point that I've been making. Uh, so I'm just saying that those setbacks are given. So what we're trying to do is to reduce those setbacks, but also when they occur, 
we should have sufficient buffer not to resort to the instrument of load shedding as, a, as something that is going to help us to support the grid. Because at that time, you'd have had the uh, uh, rich conditions of energy sovereignty. So really, load shedding is not an instrument that we are going to rely on because there's uh, sufficient uh, generating capacity. And then to cut, I just want to make an important point that uh, the vast and overwhelming majority of the men and women at ESCOM are honest, uh, diligent, professional, competent, and patriotic. I think it's a point I want to make. Significant and overwhelming, a critical mass of them. Like in, in any institution of the size of ESCOM, you'll have those elements that seeks to undermine and derail the kind of progress that we are making. So those, uh, of course, uh, will be isolated and the necessary action will be taken. Like I said, is a management function. To the extent that they require the assistance of uh, the executive authority will do that. But essentially, that uh, responsibility resides with uh, Mr. Marukan and, of course, by the board, by extension. They'll take the necessary measures to the extent that they think that uh, there's additional assistance required uh, from the minister. They will shout and then we'll work with them. Like I said also, um, the National uh, Energy uh, Crisis Committee that is supporting the minister, there's, uh, it's made up uh, of a number of work stream. Work stream number six is uh, people with the necessary expertise and qualities to help us to address the issues of uh, malfeasance, leakage, corruption, whatever you choose to call it, and they are transfixed on the resolution of that problem. Of course, uh, Sandaf uh, still remains on, uh, on site. Of course, their responsibility really is to look after the physical asset, this uh, national key point. But a lot of uh, this uh, malfeasance doesn't happen at that level. I mean, say, I mean, with regards to uh, uh, Sandaf, it's a direct, visible, and physical attack on the asset. So that's the one part. They remain to protect that asset. And then there are those things that undermine the operation. And I'm more, more than happy and confident that uh, Mr. Marokani and, uh, and uh, Mr. Ngumalo um, uh, and the various station managers are focused on the resolution of, uh, of that uh, problem. On the incentives with regards to PV, we did make the point that uh, our viewers uh, should be extended over a period of time, uh, should uh, include additional uh, components, not just uh, the PV panels, but uh, the more heavy, uh, the capital heavy uh, uh, elements, uh, including inverters and batteries. And of course, we couldn't prevail before the previous budget was uh, presented and that's an ongoing conversation I'm having with the Minister of Finance. Because I think if we go that route, we are going to see that there's going to be a, an explosion in relation to um, uh, the, the installation of rooftop solar, even at, the, at the rates that are significantly higher than what we, we are experiencing now. But also designing those uh, uh, financial instruments that can help the less affluent, if you like, the poor, to be able to access uh, uh, this uh, kind of uh, solutions because I think the unintended consequences of this is that uh, it's only the, the affluent and those who have got the, the right uh, risk profile who can borrow money from the banks and invest it in the rollout of solar PV, but the majority of people will be excluded. So we're working with the uh, Minister uh, Kubai Human Settlement, Minister Mantashe, uh, the possibility of how you relook at that uh, grant called INEP that is meant to connect people to the grid to say that can't you repurpose elements of it to make possible for us to, to be able to uh, connect the, the poor. And then on the issue of uh, coal, yes, like I said, I mean, uh, it's work that uh, is in the domain of management and we're more than confident rather that uh, Mr. Marokane and, uh, and Mr. Ngumalu, the head of generation, are on top of that, as indicated some of the interventions that have been made. And just to Terence's point, no, the... the, the Cabinet has, has said proceed, so we are proceeding with uh, the issue. So Terence is referring to um, how we work with uh, the National Transmission Company on uh, financing solutions with regards to both the modernization and expansion of the grid. So we not go, we're just going to go back to Cabinet to just uh, give a, an update. So, so the decision has been made. So where we are at now is just a finalization of that approach with the NTCSA. And I think from our side, we thought that it's appropriate that we give the NTSA an opportunity to, to look at the, um, these models that we are proposing. And then the teams have been meeting consistently, and uh, there's some degree of convergence. And once we're firmed up on an approach, uh, we should be able to jointly share 
with the, the markets how and the country how we we're going to address that uh, situation and then with regards to the electricity regulation amendment the era and um, of course it has gone through the national assembly i did make the point is the expectation is going to the ncop i made the point the last time is part of priority legislation the leader of government business in the form of the deputy president is the one that is uh, spearheading that effort. We, I still remain confident that uh, we should be able to get it through the NCOP and then it will have a life and give effect to uh, the kind of reforms we want to introduce and ensure energy security going uh, into the future. So let me really take the opportunity to, to thank everyone um, uh, for making time, members of the media, the robust questions that we always get because they can only help in clarifying these issues and making it possible for, uh, I think, the average person to consume the message. So uh, thank you very much for your attendance. Uh, wish you a lovely week ahead. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Minister. Um, colleagues, with that, we've come to the end of um, this morning's media briefing. Uh, we'll convene again um, in the next uh, two weeks as per our cadence for these EAP media briefings. Uh, thank you very much once again. Thank you. Thank you.